from Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 42, recorded on July 11, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Hey, Tim. And from here in New York, Tim Chung. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm a very bright New York. I don't know. It's completely bleaching my camera. I don't know if you guys can see. It's very bright out, yes. I'm fortunate. Tim, you have to come to the incubator sometime so you can sit in the darkness Uh, with me. (laughs) An incubate. You're not very far, you know. Um, no, I'm not. I just have to find time during the day because it's kind of hard to, yeah. Yeah, understood. Maybe some time when it's, maybe not, well, I'll have to find time like during recording because it'd be nice to like record live at the incubator. Yeah, I have a chair here where Daniel Griffin and Dixon often sit so you can come oh. here. That would be fun. Okay, I'll sneak out sometimes. All right. right, today we are, uh, we are three and uh, two neuroscientists and a virologist so, so uh, Jason has uh, graciously agreed to uh, take us through quite an interesting paper, right, Jason? Yeah, no, there's this, there's lots of uh, interesting aspects of this paper, and it touches on a, a topic that's very hot right now, which is psychedelics. Um, <laughs> and they're hot because partly because the um, the the government has freed up the rules to be able to actually do science on psychedelics. It's been really difficult to do actual studies using psychedelics um, at any sort of uh, level, you know, go from humans to animal models. <clears throat> but as you guys have probably heard in the news, there's there's been these um, clinical trials and ad hoc trials and anecdotal evidence that that psychedelics are uh, can be used to treat everything from depression to addiction, um, and um, but there's been little sort of mechanistic insight to how these psychedelics actually work and can we improve on the natural psychedelics or the the existing psychedelics that are out there. Jason, um, have any, aside from clinical trials, have any been used to treat patients? Well, the one that's most recent is ketamine. Yeah. Uh, I think we discussed that in a previous episode and um, Mm. ketamine has been used in some circumstances quite successfully for sort of treatment resistant depression um, but at doses that are thought to not really cause a, you know, a massive hallucinogenic, mm. um, experience. And so, but that's a big question, whether actually do you need the, the subjective experience in, that it comes with these, yeah. um, as part of the treatment. Um, there was a, a paper that came out, I can't remember where, but fairly recently in, um, in, if you anesthetize patients, so ketamine's also been used for anesthesia. And so certain doses Horse really tranquilizer. Magic drug because at some, you know, it has a wide variety of effects depending on how much you give to people. Mm. And um, under anesthesia, so the doses that would give, um, uh, that you would give for anesthesia, there was no benefit for depression. So that suggested perhaps there was something to do with the subjective experience that and that you your um, that you need that for the depression or to alleviate symptoms but I, I think that that study was fairly controversial so, so Jason I love their definition of psychedelics compounds that produce alterations to sensory self time and space perception that are so alien to everyday experience that they shed new light on the workings of these everyday mental functions. So alien to everyday experience. That's great, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is, uh, so the paper we're going to talk about, it was published in nature in June, um, 14th of June. 
And uh, this is from the lab of Gul Dolan at Johns Hopkins University. As an aside, Gul and I actually are colleagues. We uh, trained in the same lab. She was a postdoc. I was a postdoc in Mark Baer's lab, and she was a student mm. at MIT. Um, and uh, first author is Romain Nardu with uh, a few other collaborators on there. And the title was called Psychedelics Reopen the Social Reward Learning Critical Period. So we there's a few concepts there, and, uh, you know, we've covered some of the, these before. Um, and the, the sort of main concept here is critical windows of plasticity and learning. And we, we know, again, that during development, there's heightened plasticity in the brain, um, and that, that translates to being able to learn uh, certain things in, in a very easy and um, sort of unconscious almost way. And this trans, then this is this is in humans as well as um, animals, of course. And um, the social reward learning aspect of this, we'll, we'll go into the behavior that they actually um, test in in, in mice. Um, but really, what the the premise of this main of this paper is that they want to um, try and figure out: is there su- sort of a, a, a subjective or or even objective uh, mechanism for all psychedelics and how do they act- actually uh, affect behavior because uh, most of these some of these psychedelics have different mechanisms of action they are activating different receptors and so it's been confusing uh, in the literature to sort of try and figure out why s- the these psychedelics um, seem to uh, have similar properties. Um, and one, one idea is that, um, they converge on this plasticity, this brain plasticity in some way. And, um, so that's what they set out to, to do is that they wanted to test, uh, various psychedelics. And again, the, the way they define psychedelics in, in humans is that they cause th- this sort of behavioral state change where you, you either hallucinate or you experience subjective um, changes in in your internal how you see, perceive the world. Now, those, those parts of the hallucinogenics, as a definition, you can't really test in a mouse because you can't tell mm. per se if they're although, hallucinating. Although we did do a, a twin episode on hallucinating, how to test for hallucinating in the mouse, <laughs> but it is very much a behavior like you have to kind of guess what the mouse is doing um, purely by behavior. They won't tell you it's hallucinating. So Jason, exactly. they say that MDMA is an empathogen. It makes you pro-social, right? What does that mean? Yeah, and so this is, I mean, that's why MDMA is the party drug because partly when you take it, it just makes you feel good and then you also feel... Um, extroverted that makes you feel like you makes everyone want to hug each other yeah that's what i heard basically i could say you could say it just makes makes you makes people feel less inhibited okay or enough that they in a social situation um if they are introverted or they're they're not or they're reticent to to interact with people these drugs help that so is that what they mean that the drug opens social reward window in people because you become this way you know, maybe you were like that as a kid, right? And then it went away. Yeah, I mean, so the social reward aspect, they had previously published a paper showing that MDMA um, can control the social reward critical window mm-hmm. um, in mice. Right. But what's and, weird is that they found in the same uh, paper, previous paper, they found that this social reward they have a. I'm sure we'll talk about it soon. But there's a behavior task of testing social reward, and this social reward capacity to develop social reward goes away as you grow up, right? Which kind of is a bit sad as as hum, as an animal in the world that we seem to have this critical period for social reward. Yeah, yeah and that itself is interesting, right? So I mean. You know, um, mice are social creatures just like humans. Uh, but I would, you know, so we'd probably argue that humans are even more social 
Um, and part of this, I think, is that many uh, animals have uh, social dominance or social hierarchy where there's learning involved. You have sort of have to learn who's, who's you know, the pecking order of things. And uh, it is interesting, at least in mice, that this is a, a constrained window of learning. And then mm-hmm. after a certain period of time in adult mice, they – they know they're, <laughs> they're they really learned their their social place, and so perhaps this is just an evolutionary way of mm-hmm. um, you know balancing the the plasticity and and learning and 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 because you don't really want to rewrite the social rules every mm-hmm. um, every few months. But yeah, that's that's a hand waving explanation for why there is a critical period of this kind of mm. reward. But I, you know, it's sort of a misnomer because so, they they call it social reward, but in, in, in a um, what it really is 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 that they um, they place an animal in a in a box, and that box has you know cues. So there are certain aspects that they can learn ab- about the box, and then they introduce um, uh, this condition. It's, it's called a condition place preference. So they introduce a conspecific animal where they can, you know, interact with each other. And um, then they come back and they put the animal in a different box or, or the same box. And um, in, in that way, if there's a, a reward associated with the um the box that they met the con specific, there is a preference for exploring that box and going into that box if they had a choice. Um, so there's lots of things here that could pl- make it, you know, harder to learn. It could be that the cues um, become harder to learn. There's certainly evidence that that sort of spatial learning could also have critical periods. And then the social aspect is like, oh, well, do they care about meeting another animal or is it you know is it something that makes them curious or is uh is there a rewarding um experience for the animal hmm. yeah it's um, kind of it's kind of like uh i picture like i recently went to uh england to see my uh niece um and it's kind of similar to if she given a choice of going to the playground where her, she and her friend can hang out and play versus going to a bedroom all by herself. She'll probably go and choose hang out in the playground and yeah. seek that out. So that this is be, kind of so like that wouldn't be for every kid, though, right? Uh, Depend on whether they're within the critical period. How long is um, the, how long is the critical period in humans? Oh, I don't know whether there's one in human. I don't think that's been tested. No. I yeah, I mean, I think the classic sort of um, developmental learning window is, um, you know, t- up to about teenage years, mm-hmm. and then. But but we know that that there's a lot still going on in brain development all the way up until like, you know, twenty one year old uh, males. So anything below twenty one years of age, you you, you could say is <laughs> a developmental window, but. Mm. Um, I was going to say, but we don't know whether the same kind of social reward window exists in human. But I also remember hearing about studies about um, children who are not social, socialized when they're young can have difficulties developing social relationship in the adult. So maybe yeah, that is. Exactly. Uh, so, so I would say some of those really early childhood experiences, um, whether it's in a sort of an isolation kind of experience or traumatic experience, uh, those are hard to, um, when you become an adult to, to get, get over those experiences, they're very formative. And, but, and if you can imagine ex- those sorts of experiences you, you may also have as an adult, but they don't seem to be as impactful, um, hmm. or long lasting in terms of changing your behavior or your, your the way you respond to, to situations. So there's definitely something about that or those early childhood um, experiences that are important for setting you up and, and changing your personality or altering your personality that the impact of those experiences are much bigger than if you're an adult. Um, mm-hmm. 
So I would, you know, I think there's still plasticity. There's still, of course, we can still learn as an adults, but I think the impact of these experiences in humans are much more uh, when you're younger. Well, the, the classic exper- uh, example is language, right? It's much easier to learn a foreign language when you're younger. Exactly. You, you can still learn it as an adult, but it's harder, <laughs> right? You have to put more work yeah. into it. <laughs> Um, so maybe if you take a psychedelic, you could learn any language when you're 80, right? Well, you know, so this is where, <laughs> um, exactly. So sort of trying to figure out exactly what these psychedelics are doing in terms of brain plasticity, I think is key. Um, and so that's the, the premise of this paper. And so we've talked about the main assay that they use, the social reward conditioning assay. Um, and then they essentially took adult mice and injected them with different psychedelics to see what would happen to this uh, this learning, and so the the psychedelics that they're testing, um, so they ha- they're they've got LSD, they've got MDMA, and they've got uh, ketamine, uh, and then one other one called ibogaine, and uh, and also psilocybin actually psilocybin psilocybin. Mm-hmm. Which is the active ingredient in magic mushroom. mushrooms. Yeah, yep. right. You think it would be the magic, but it's actually the psilocybin. Um, <laughs> and so they take these, and it's it's pretty simple. They take these animals, they you know put them in a home cage, they pre-test them, then they do the social conditioning with the conspecific or the cage mates, and then they put them in isolation. And then they, for 24 hours, and they put them back in those boxes to see which which ones they prefer, which box did they prefer, the one where there was a, uh, a cage mate or not. But the cage, importantly, the cage mate are no longer there. It was right. just previously been associated with cage mate, and it probably still smells like mm-hmm. their previous cage mate. Um, yeah, so they have to, it, so it's a kind of like a learning something that previously occurred, yeah. Right. And so that pretest was done before the social conditioning, so they have a baseline. And and so what they found was that at this age in mice of mice, I think um, how old were they? They, you know, six months of age and older. Yeah, hundred days old. So like hundred days old, three months, three no, months, four, three and a half months. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. See, and in, in, in mouse year terms, this would be I don't know. 30-year-old mice? Well, three months is like, yeah, I would say, yeah, maybe late 20s, something like that. (laughs) Um, And so what they found is that if you, in saline injected animals, there was no no preference for either, for for that box where they met the conspecific um, at all, there was really no, they didn't really care. But after injection with all of these, any of these psychedelics, there were now was a preference for um, that social uh, experience. Mm. So that was cool. So that's figure one. Um, and they still see Actually, similar I- magnitude of, of responses, at least for, for most of these. Could I quickly highlight something quite interesting? Yeah. Um, which is in the original paper, they uh, they already discovered this uh, to be true for MDMA, which is the party and pathogen drug mm-hmm. that right. makes you want to hug people and you empathize with the feelings, and you know people talk talk their feelings out a lot, and that's why I think um, psychotherapists are, are interested in using it for therapy. Um, what's interesting is that, um, as I think Vincent mentioned earlier, um, MDMA they call it a pro-social drug. Mm. So it increases social ability in humans and also in mice. But some of the drugs, some of the psychedelics they tested here, for example, psilocybin, LSD, um, and probably ketamine, probably also ibogaine, all of them are not pro-social. They don't necessarily mm. increase your likelihood to interact with other people. Mm. So for example, like famously, like LSD, which is acid, can can be quite uh, apparently can be quite tough in terms of for you to communicate with other people, so you're kind of like you know retreating in your own head and stuff. So they're not actually prosocial, but for whatever reasons, they can still reopen this social reward window such that later on you seem to be mm. you seem to enjoy social interaction more 
so that you seek it out more. Um, but I think, you know, one, one, and we can discuss at the end, but, but it's not clear if this is specific to a social reward. It could be that you, you, there's any novelty, any stimulus that, that would uh, uh, be something worth trying to note or learn could be mm. enhanced. And so that's something that they, mm. you know, still remains to be seen how specific this kind of um, reopening of plasticity is, whether it's mm. just for this kind of social um, aspect or is it, um, you know, vis- there's, there's, there's classic visual responses that could be also used to, to test this mm-hmm. idea. Um, okay. So, you know, they also show that in, in, um, some of the supplements that when you, when they get treated with the psychedelics, that doesn't change the, um, addiction like behaviors that you get with cocaine reward learning or amphetamine um, application. So that's interesting in that because um, you can have a similar kind of assay where you get cocaine in one of those boxes and um, there they show that there is no change with psychedelics. Although if you give cocaine to an adult mouse, they, they're going to want, they, it's rewarding. So it's not unexpected that you'd get, you know, a change there. But what is potentially also interesting is that some of these psychedelics are being considered for addiction treatment. Mm. So perhaps you might actually explain, expect the opposite in that it would block your preference for previously, you know, cocaine associated box. Right. Um, but it seemed to just not do much. Right. Un- unlike for the social, yeah. Um, so the next question, so that so that was pretty straightforward and the, the data seems clear. But the next question that they sort of wanted to address here was that many of these psychedelics, when you take them as a human, the, the objective ex- or the subjective experience that you have, the duration of the ma- or and magnitude of the experience is really different depending on which psychedelic you take. Um, so... For example, psilocybin and MDMA, the duration of the experience lasts a couple of hours, three to six hours. Um, LSD and Ibogaine, Ibogaine they, are, they persist for longer, up to two days. So I guess you could have a tr- or even longer um, in, in terms of the trip that you have. And so they're trying to, so now they're taking a big leap, right? So they're trying to go and say, okay, the duration of these in humans, the effects are different. Um, how long is the effect in mice on this social reward learning? Um, and does it correlate with the, the duration of the experience in humans? Um, and so they followed up um, after the treatment at different time periods, one week, two weeks, to see um, whether the, the duration, you know, when when does the effect go away? Um, mm. and, and so they, they see that there are differences um, in, in the effects where um, ketamine, the, the effect of ketamine, for example, is, is, is acute and, and very short lasting. Basically, after a week, there's no effect. But LSD and psilocybin now you do get effects, and LSD even up to three weeks after the injection, um, and for ibogaine four weeks after the injection. And so they have this interesting figure, figure three, where um, there was some back and forth about this on Twitter because if you look at the figure, it's basically just a schematic. There's no data on this. Is unusual for a nature figure to have no data in it, but they draw drew these curves on the, you know, the, how long the effects last for the, um, the effects on the social reward learning mm. and they correlate this with the uh, subjective experiences that humans have. So you could, you know, you could take it with a grain of salt in that, um, they're sort of now saying, okay, well, there's some sort of experience that's happening in the mice that correlates with what humans, um, also see. So basically they, they drew these – well, they say they based it on figures one, two, and extended data five, right? But there's no – the y-axis, there's no numbers. That's what you're saying. It's just a pattern, right? Right, mm. right. 
yeah, it's it's. <laughs> So, so in other words, the ketamine is a really sh- is a really sharp peak, and the the actual shape of that be- probably has nothing to do with the way it is. The same for the psilocybin and MDMA; they persist a while, and then they draw a sigma curve. But who knows if that's how it goes down, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, they've only got you know four time points yeah. of data that they use to plot the at least the social reward learning, and then who knows where. <laughs> how they got this sort of, you know, what the subjective effects are yeah, on the yeah. y-axis. Um, so, yeah, take with take it with a grain of salt. I mean, if you look at it and you're not critical, you go, oh, it's the same in people and mice. Of course, the, the time scale is different. The x-axis well, is different. Well, I mean, well, that's the other thing that they, they basically, it's exactly the same graph that they've drawn for both, both yeah, of these. They've so. just got weeks on one and hours on the other. Yeah. It's yeah. very strange. Yeah. Um, okay, so you know, but but the certainly it seems like there's differences in the dur- duration of effects, um, and so then they go into trying to figure out what whether there's a common mechanism of how these are um, acting, and again they sort of base this next experiment on a previous uh, paper that they, that they published, where um, and, they're, and here they're introducing a concept called metaplasticity, and one can think of, so we talked about synaptic plasticity where there are sort of different rules. You can strengthen or weaken synapses um, and those those are called long-term potentiation or long-term depression of synaptic function. And there's something called metaplasticity where so if a, if a, a neuron undergoes LTP and some synapses are potentiated, um, that changes the rules for subsequent um, plasticity. So essentially the history of plasticity in that cell dictates, dictates the rules that, that would then go on. So for an example, hmm. let's say after LTP, the first round of LTP in that neuron, the same stimulus would be, wouldn't be able to induce LTP again because you, you've reached some sort of hmm. set point or saturation. Um, and the metaplasticity that they are testing here is that they had found that um, oxytocin, which is a, uh, a natural neuropeptide that's in the brain and that's associated with also social behavior, um, induces this LTD, this depression of synaptic um, uh, plasticity or synaptic function. And But if they put that oxytocin on by itself it doesn't do much they 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 had to take slices from animals that were injected with MDMA and then they see that um, that the oxytocin has um, an effect so basically their idea is that there's there's increased plasticity but it's not just that you just get more plasticity um, it's quite nuanced in that it seems to um, be permissive for uh, plasticity or, or for, for a sort of natural kind of plasticity in a way. Um, and so they did this by taking brain slices and recording from those brain slices using patch clamp. And we've discussed how, to, how what that measures. Um, but essentially, they can then record the, the very fine-tuned amount of synaptic function in these cells. And what they find is that just like with MDMA, all of the other psychedelics, when when they inject them into the mice and take out their brains, now they oxytocin has an effect. It can induce this uh, depression of synaptic function. Um, and, and so again, what's surprising here is that even though these psychedelics seem to act in different ways in terms of the receptors and the, um, what we thought how they worked, the commonality here is that there seems to be a change in the rules of plasticity, synaptic plasticity, in that now oxytocin, if you add oxytocin, it, it, it can induce plasticity. Now, what this means in terms of like why this would then enhance social preference or um, reopen this critical window. That's, you know, not super clear. Um, but I, I guess the take home is that, that these psychedelics are able to 
uh, change the rules in the in, in brain in the brain to heighten natural plasticity mechanisms. And uh, and also, um, there's they have one condition where they tested they injected ketamine, but they waited long enough so that the critical period has gone away because ketamine critical period, as Jason Jason mentioned earlier, is very short because mm-hmm. ketamine is very short lasting. So if they waited two weeks after ketamine when the mouth of social preference gone, gone back to indifference, and then they open the brain and they look at the slices, they realize the oxytocin no longer works. So it seems to correlate time-wise very tightly to this. Uh, mm. the, the metaplasticity correlates very well to the critical period. Yeah. Right. It's quite nice. Yeah. So then they're going back to the, the mechanism of action, they thought, okay, well, the receptors that these... Um, drugs are supposed to activate are different. Um, but is that the case in, in our system? Can we sort of mm-hmm. figure this out? And so one of the receptors that um, many do act on are their serotonin receptors. So LSD is the most famous one. Uh, same with psilocybin and MDMA. So they, um, they then try and target the specific serotonin receptor, the 5-HT2A receptor. Um, and, th- and so they give the psychedelics plus an antagonist to that serotonin receptor. And then they look at um, whether that alters the ability to reopen the critical period. And it did not. So um, even though LSD and um well, it, it, it did, I guess, it did in the um, drugs that you'd expect it to. So LSD is supposed to bind this receptor. If you block this receptor, you don't get the condition, t- um, the, 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 incre- the critical period reopening. But in the drugs that um, we expect they don't bind the serotonin receptor, there was no effect. So that receptor is not a universal mechanism for how these are drugs are acting. Um, and it was the same for another receptor called beta arrestin, hmm. um, which is thought to be downstream of, um, the serotonin receptor in terms of, um, activating s- the signaling in the cell. And, um, again, they find that the the drugs that activate the serotonin receptor, they do act through this beta arrestin pathway as you would expect because that's the, the, the receptor that's inducing the, the activation. Um, so then they thought, okay, well, the, the conclusion here is that we're not wrong about the receptors. These psychedelics are acting through different receptors and if you block those receptors, you block the effect. But why are they all affecting the same uh, kind of behavior or the same plasticity? So now they do uh, a modern neuroscience experiment where they do RNA <laughs> sequencing to look for gene expression changes uh, induced by these drugs. Um, and essentially they, they say that they sort of find uh, only a few common changes in gene expression um, between all of them. And what those genes then seem to pinpoint um, are alterations in the extracellular matrix. Um, and that's something I don't, I'm not sure we've touched on too much in, in twin, but all cells have a coat, coat around them and um that's called the extracellular matrix, and that coats usually a combination of proteins and sugars and carbohydrates and, and neurons. That coat, this ECM, is actually really important for function, and it's actually not really well understood. But um, there's a, a nice correlation with the development of the ECM. So more uh, coating, more ECM, the less plasticity you see in a neuron. Um, So this gene expression pattern that they've identified suggests that maybe the commonality of what they're all acting on is changes in the ECM that could then, you know, um, 
reopen the critical period, increase metaplasticity, that sort of thing. Now, those genes that they identified, you know, they're just basically just using sort of the, the classic um, uh, gene ontology kind of way of identifying what their function is. They don't actually go into the details of how those genes could function in this particular mechanism or setting, but it's intriguing and it gives, um, it gives a, a future direction for sort of trying to figure out exactly what these psychedelics are acting on in terms of mechanism. Um, and they have a nice little working model at the end here to sort of describe what they think is happening. Um, so does that make sense that the, if you, if you mess with the ECM, you're going to, so, uh, so how would that give you metaplasticity? What is it doing? It's it's making transmission, neurotransmission more promiscuous? Is that the idea? Yeah. So one idea is that, and this has been shown in in, um, in various ways, that the the ECM, the, and the ECM coding is specific to certain kinds of neurons, mm -hmm. and especially these inhibitory neurons. And so um, there's sort of a when you have this fully developed ECM the inhibitory tone or the amount of inhibition is, is really strong. And if you block that ECM development, then you get less inhibition. And so you, you, you get more plasticity and that's, that's a sort of simplified model. Um, is that because the ECM is an insulator in a way? Well, it, it, that's where it's not clear what that ECM is actually doing to sort of be, you know, to, to help in a bit in does, these inhibitory neurons function. Does it stabilize synapse? Yeah, right. It, mm -hmm. One thing it can potentially do is stabilize synapse. There's actually um, uh, Roger Chen, who was a Nobel laureate, who he, he, he was famous for um, developing GFP. GFP and fluorescent proteins. Before he, he died, he put out this sort of... Um, ideas kind of paper with no real data saying, mm -hmm. well, ECM, the holes in ECM could be where information is stored. <laughs> um, but the general idea was that perhaps these ECM um, interactions could stabilize synapses. And right. one can imagine that, you know, you get a structure, the synapse changes its function, but it's a, there's a structure associated with it. And that the ECM could then stabilize that structure and allow it to to store the information. And if you did that, you, there'd be less plasticity because you couldn't. Once the synapse is stabilized and set, almost like a concrete kind of um, idea, that um, that would inhibit plasticity. And that if you took away the ECM, broke up the concrete, now that is, mm -hmm. there's a lot more flexibility in that structure. Actually, we did a. Again, going back to previous episodes, we did do a episode on the um, critical period for mm -hmm. visual acuity right. mm -hmm. and how that was mediated by astrocytes. And in that paper, they dissolved uh, a certain part of ECM called the perineuronal nets that controls a lot of these kind of GABAergic inhibitory signaling mm -hmm. and that open up the critical period, presumably by affecting plasticity. So, exactly. so it kind of fits. Yeah, it also fits here. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I would say, what... Um, the, we know the most about um, in terms of what ECM is useful for in terms of plasticity and that ECM in the visual system correlates again with an inhibitory function as well. Um, so it's, but, you know, it's intriguing. But presumably, they kind of mentioned it in the discussion as well, presumably not, it didn't open all sorts of plasticity because um, psychedelics don't tend to promote addiction learning, learning about addictive drugs. If anything, they promote kind of um, uh, learning against addiction drugs. So like they treat their treatment for addiction. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, potentially more complicated than being permissive for all sorts of learning. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in mice, you know, I think that's where there's certainly lots of uh, future experiments to do. Um, and, but again, I think the big leap here is sort of trying to um, correlate the effects they see in mice with what human, you know, human experiences. And it sort of still leaves that question of whether you actually need the trip, the subjective hallucinogenic aspect of these to function. Um, 
but it's nice to see. I mean, there's a lot, lot of um, universities now that are opening centers for psychedelic uh, research, and um, I think it's psychedelic sort of drugs, not psychedelic research. Right? <laughs> psychedelic, psychedelic, well, psychedelic research on psychedelic drugs. Yeah. Um, and I think it's you know it's, it's timely, it's useful. I think um, a lot of these. Uh, drugs that were banned in terms of, you know, a total ban and, and studying them has been somewhat of a um, set us back in science, at least in trying to understand how they work. And um, there's certainly also a lot of uh, labs now trying to figure out ways of making new versions of these that would not affect, would not give you the trip, but still have the effect on depression or whatever else that they're looking at. Um, hmm. And, uh, but, but I think the dangers are that, you know, um, and I've seen this from my friends they're, they're like, we, you know, they always ask me, you know, what should I take? Should I do, should it, should I microdose on LSD or should I do this or that on, on drugs? And now that they're becoming easy, easier to, uh, uh, obtain, we still don't really know, you know, what's good for you and what's not. Um, that so, was, <laughs> that was actually, a. uh, paper out from Imperial College London, I think, maybe a year ago, where they, because microdosing is kind of getting quite popular. So there, but no one ever has done any research study because you can't, we still can't do clinical trial of microdosing. It's still not yet legal. Hmm. Um, but they managed to get people to self microdose at home, um, but still blind themselves in terms of treatment groups. So they can either give themselves a microdose of LSD or a placebo. And it's all done at home by the kind of uh, participant. It's just normal people who are microdosing. And the finding was that the microdosing effect that people, uh, mm. people when people do microdosing and they say it really helps them kind of be more productive, um, it's all placebo. There was no actual oh effect. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the bane of uh, uh, any mental health studies. I mean, it's just the well, placebo, placebo effect is strong. Is so it's very strong. strong. It's a, um, there's also a similar study at the University of Chicago. Yeah, they mm. did the same thing, microdosing, and it had no therapeutic effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Mm. But you know, yeah, if people believe that it will help them, that's that's true. <laughs> it's one big step to um, having an effect, but. But I think there's something there to be figured out. And I mean, certainly this idea that these drugs are affecting plasticity seems clear. Um, and I think the fact that it's not sort of a sledgehammer, it's not that they are completely rewiring the brain. They're just sort of being permissive for, for, for future plasticity may be a good thing as opposed to some of the other drugs that, are, that you take that, that um, you know, are sledgehammers. Um, but one thing about this study, though, that I don't quite understand is that they really kind of honed in on how well these psychedelics are opening, reopening up this critical period for social reward. So it's a very social reward driven paper. Um, but all these psychedelics are the reason why we are researching them. One of the reasons why is because of their treatment potential for things like depression, ranging from depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, PTSD, and also addiction. And there's no, in this paper, at least, so I, I'm not in this field, so I don't know, but at least in this paper, there's no link between social reward and any of these potential yeah. treatment. Yeah. Um, so I do wonder, you know, like what would happen if you, if the, if the researchers tested, you know, addiction-like behavior or depressive-like behavior or like... I don't know what uh, an animal model of PTSD is, but you know those kind of things. Are there stroke yeah. uh, stroke models in mice? Because they talk about post stroke learning, right? We, I presume Ooh, there's stroke. there are stroke models, yeah. And I think there's also a critical period after stroke where you want to get some rehab done early, but not too late. Mm. There's some research on that too. Yeah, this is one of those classic sort of. Um, papers where it's uh, based on a previous paper by the same group. That's their bread and butter. They have this really nice assay to, that's working. And then they try to fit it into um, a correlation with human behavior. And that's where it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big stretch. But 
the fact that they all these psychedelics seem to have a same effect at some point is really cool. Um, and the fact that they may converge on uh, a gene program is also cool. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about, you know, what those genes are actually doing. And um, there's going to be a lot of work to try to figure that out. But, but they've sort of bypassed the controversy in terms of mechanism of action in terms of the receptors that are involved. Yeah, so that's, yeah. you know, that's, that's a big leap. Yeah. But I also do wonder whether does this, I've been, I was a little critical about the lack of link to all these psychiatric disorder like um, depression and PTSD and just honing on the social side. But what if this paper is actually going a little bit deeper and suggesting kind of social interaction actually is an important treatment uh, pathway to all these things? Um, because yeah. that might be the common mechanism for these psychedelics. Yeah. Well, I think I think on the converse, there's certainly a, you know dramatic effects on behavior and, and mental health uh, when you're socially isolated, mm. and so there is this. Um, essentially, we've been seeing that with COVID and um, the effects of uh, long term effects of, of isolation are are not trivial. I think humans as a whole, we need most of us need social interactions of some sort. Um, but I, again, I I sort of caution the relevance here as well in that um this is i i see this as as a learning uh experience and whether it's uh, how specific the effects are to the social aspect of it the rewarding aspect of it i'm not that that's that you know you'd have to do some more assays i agree to figure that mm -hmm. out and it could just be that you're enhancing learning learning itself learning plasticity or learning and whether it's because they are they it makes the mice uh, you know e it's uh, easier to can make a memory versus whether it's because they now find it more rewarding to interact with an animal these experiments i don't think really distinguish that hmm so, so, but flip it on sorry vincent so so what you can say is that they found that these drugs Open the critical period for social reward learning, which is very interesting, probably in different ways. But in other other effects, we can't conclude yet, right? As as you said before, Tim, and that uh, requires some more experiments. Yeah, I, th I think so. Well, I would, I would go further than just say that the social aspect of this, um, to me, is not it's not clear how important that is mm. either. Okay. Um, they use this assay as a way to sort of probe memory and learning, um, but they ha it's not they haven't really been able to distinguish this just because you get a general increase in the ability to make a memory versus oh it's specific to okay. you know, like for example they they show that cocaine pref uh, uh, preference um, or learning is not altered, but cocaine is a sledgehammer. I mean that's a huge stimulus. I would like to see something more mundane, like you know, a novel object or some new smell mm. or some something that they can associate. Mm. That, um, uh, but I guess you know, the problem is that many of these learning paradigms. It's not clear if there's. It's not really clear that there's a um, critical window, mm. but you could see if that if that learning is enhanced. Yeah. I actually, I wonder if um, how much of the psychiatric disorder that the psychedelics are supposed to treat, like PTSD and depression, how much of those, how much of the causes might even be linked to the extracellular matrix that this psychedelics are supposed to open up? Um, I don't know if there's much work done on that, um, but yeah, like it, it would be quite interesting if depression and PTSD all have completely different kind of genesis, like the cause is different, but opening up this ECM, the extracellular matrix can somehow be almost like the silver bullet that, right. that beats mm. things. It, it sounds perhaps too good to be true, yeah, probably, but probably psychedelics is. can, can <laughs> just be, because psychedelics can be quite life altering in terms of the experience because it really as as Vincent described at the beginning it is alien <laughs> to an everyday experience right so maybe it really is the the thing to, to so 
uh, would you say, Jason, that uh, pursuing this ECM line is important to figure out if, in fact, that's what's involved to, to maybe target a few of the genes that are involved in remodeling and see if you get similar effects? Yeah, exactly. I think for sure. And I think, I mean, I think just in general, this, the understanding how ECM affects brain plasticity, yeah. regardless of sort of the psychedelic aspect is a, is a interesting field. Um, both for sort of thinking about how to enhance cognition in various ways, like in a stroke mm-hmm. condition as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a really novel direction. There's a, Summary of this article in, um, I don't know, the News Medical Life Sciences, um, uh, which is pretty good. I'll put a link uh, to this in the show notes. But they made this um, this uh, this statement, which I want to find and read, which is quite interesting. Here. Um, the, so this is a quote from Doolin. The open state of the critical period may be an opportunity for a post-treatment integration period to maintain the learning state. Too often after having a procedure or treatment, people go back to their chaotic, busy lives that can be overwhelming. Clinicians may want to consider the time period after a psychedelic drug dose as a time to heal and learn, much like we do for open heart surgery. I kind of touched on that a little bit today. Yeah, yeah. so that, I mean, that's... Um and it kind of goes to the this idea that we, you know, I think this is the problem with mental health treatment in the in general is that, you know, you think you give a drug and that's it, you're good, or it's going to be a cure, or it's going to be some sort of magic bullet. Um, but but time again, you know, the the best uh, outcomes are when you combine the the drug with behavioral therapy or mm. or, or counseling or something where it's not just treating or allowing the brain to heal or something, um, but it's also treating whatever is underlying those issues in terms of perhaps a cause or at least um, being uh, something where it's you're actively doing something in a behavioral way to um, facilitate the, the change. And this seems to be the case for like PTSD treatment where um, – what the drugs seem to do are reopen the plasticity. So now you're, you're, the goal is that you've got this abnormal uh, response to a, a stimulus and you want to dissociate the response from the stimulus. And the way to do that is that they try to get people to re-experience the traumatic events in a very safe environment, in a controlled environment. Um, and so the drugs then are supposed to enhance that that sort of transformation of yeah. allowing the, the brain to make that dissociation. Um, and I think that's what's, what, what Gould's probably saying here as well is that if you, you also need to take into account the duration of the effect. So ketamine, perhaps, you know, if you um, have got, uh, the, the, the behavioral therapy too long afterwards, it's not going to be very, um, um, it's not going to work very well. Mm. Um, on the other hand, if you take LSD and you have a bad experience somewhere in the three days that you're still, there's still perhaps an effect, then that could be harmful. Um, and that's, I think also, you know, and that's sort of interesting when I talk to people about what helps them if they take a a drug or, you know, microdosing, whatever. And I think it does depend on what they're doing. So like, Mm. Here, I know of some friends that will take LSD out in the desert and it's a controlled environment and that there's not a lot of, you know, external stimulation. You're not, um, you're not in a city, you're, you're not, you're not all, all, a whole bunch of things happening. You're in a very quiet, controlled environment and maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, and I think like back in the 60s when people were first experimenting with LSD, like you see some of these videos of subjects taking LSD and then there's a scientist in a kind of white lab coat with a clipboard <laughs> and someone with a camera points at them, kept asking them questions. And I don't think that was conducive to, you know, any good therapy outcome. So, yeah, I wonder. So, yeah, the the... the it seems like the experience when you're on the drug 
um, would be quite important. Which in this paper, they put the mice back with a litter mate, with a, with a cage mate, right after they gave the drug. So I wonder if there are things they can do, like, you know, if the mouse is by themselves, do they mm -hmm. do any different and that kind right. of stuff? Yeah, the whole th yeah, a lot of things you could test, right? Yeah. You could, you could do mazes and all that stuff and see learning. Yeah, that would be cool. All right. Thank you, Jason. That's that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That is Twin42. Show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. If you have any questions about this, you should send them in to twin at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, uh, we would love to have your financial support. We do not run ads on YouTube. Uh, I, I don't like them and you shouldn't like them either, even though a lot of people make a lot of money. We depend on you just giving us a few dollars a month. And uh, you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. A couple of ways uh, you can do that. Uh, Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Have you joined Threads yet? I did, although I, <laughs> probably just because it was easy to uh, go from my Instagram account to Threads. Yes. Um, yep, I did the same thing. It'll be interesting to see how that all goes they, down. They have 100 million people already. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, I, I did it too. Um, I mean, I can't beat Twitter. I have 165,000 followers on Twitter. That's uh, yeah. That's that was since two thousand and eight. I've been on there a long time, so I can't throw that away. But it's hard to. I mean, and my Instagram was for photography, and so mm. Twitter was more for science. Now I've got those two worlds colliding. They're colliding. You bet. <laughs> yep. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent, and thanks, Jason. It was fun paper to read. Yeah. And Vincent Racaniello, you can find me at virology dot. WS. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.